point, even in a questionable economic environment, you are worried about not adopting this. And I think that that is the difference between predictive and generative. And maybe that's hype. Maybe it isn't. But I've seen clients who you wouldn't think would want to spend money on this or wouldn't necessarily see a use case come up with lots of use cases and want to adopt generative AI immediately. Gene Roberts, Data Robots Financial Markets CTO, highlights the significance of accessible data for AI adoption and discusses balancing technology with human concerns in data transformations. Hello, everyone. My name is Rob Osell, filling in for Tracy Lee for another episode in our series about engineering leadership. Today, I'm happy to be speaking with Gene Roberts, the field CTO of financial markets at Data Robot. Gene, how are you doing today? I'm doing really well. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, thanks for being here. Um, you've had such a fascinating career and you're into perhaps some of the hottest fields right now with AI and data science. So I'm sure we're going to have an amazing conversation. But for people that aren't familiar or haven't met you before, can you kind of let us know a little bit about how you arrived at this point of being the field CTO at DataRobot? Sure. So I have a non-traditional background and we should talk about why I think that that is great to hire for. Um, I went to Cornell. I was actually in the hotel school at Cornell. I started off in engineering and then moved to the hotel school because I really liked the business side of, of just in general, just like finance. Um, and then I came out and I worked in investment banking. So I worked in investment banking for four years. I worked at Lehman Brothers. And when Lehman fell, I was there. And I decided that that was a good time to go and get my PhD because everything was melting down and it seemed like it was a good time to take a break. So I went to Pitt and I got a PhD in strategy and applied stats. So they paid me to take math classes for three and a half years. So I treated it like banking and I was done really fast. And then I came back out and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. And data was exploding. Big data was exploding in 2013. And that's when I graduated. And I went to American Express and I was there for a couple of years um, working on a data warehouse. And then I moved to AIG to their science team. And I went back into a bank, but led a an, an equity research co-led an equity research team for a time, and then I co-led a data science team where we were um, using NLP on doctors' notes to um, create time series that we were then predicting stock movement with. So I've sort of done everything, um, and then I was a customer of Data Robots from that time period. So I was a customer for four years. And when they came to me last year and said, hey, do you want to come here and work here since you've been here? You, you've been one of our customers for so long and, and you, you've brought in other customers. So that's how I came to be here. Um, I think for me, it's it's been important to have the non-traditional background where you're able to talk to your clients with empathy and understand the pain that they're going through. And it's also important to have the technical background so that you have credibility with them as well, because, you know, what are you without credibility? That's really interesting. Um, I'm kind of curious. I mean, it sounds like you've explained it a little bit with this background of, uh, uh, you know, being fascinated with the, the hotel side of the, the school, you know, coming up and, and the business element and getting a leadership taste from a, a young age in your career. But what as you kind of went and got that PhD and came out and, you know, obviously your, your technical skills and your engineering skills were so in demand, what sort of uh, drew you back to the, the leadership track and then becoming a CTO instead of uh, sort of just sort of going deeper and deeper in the data science route? I think I had, I had a number of really great managers, especially at Lehman. And a lot of them I'm actually still in a book club with. They're female managers. So it was a, we still have a women's book club for Lehman that's been around for the past, I don't know, almost 20 years. So I wanted to do the same thing that they had done where they had really fostered my development and they had made a point of making sure that I got opportunities to be a manager, that I had opportunities to help mentor others through their career paths. And I think also I'd seen bad managers um, o over my career, whether it be my manager or others. And there weren't, there also weren't a lot of women. I mean, that group that I just mentioned, the reason why we're so tight knit is because there were not many of us. So I think setting an example and being a female manager was important to me. And I think also just that mentorship piece was important as well. And I think 
I think it is a trade-off. I It does make me sad sometimes when I'm not as hands-on as I want to be. But I do have to remember that the people that I have mentored and the people that I have managed over the years are now doing, it's it's a mul multiplicative effect. And I have to remember that when I get sad that I'm not doing as much coding as I used to be doing. You've had a lot of experience with different places, you know, coming out in, in sort of this ecosystem, the big data ecosystem. So you've gotten to see this as people were starting to adopt this from the first stages. And that data literacy doesn't come quickly or come cheaply. So I'm wondering if you could maybe help people uh, introspect a little bit and share some of the things that you've learned that maybe are making data adoption and sort of uh, these sort of model adoption harder at companies, some of the maybe technical challenges or maybe organizational challenges that you've seen that is getting in people's way when they first sort of uh, start harnessing these kind of technologies and techniques? It's a good question. I think the initial infrastructure, if you are a large company that has been around for a long time, you have a technological infrastructure that you made out of convenience over many, many years. And most of those systems don't talk to each other. And you may have to go from one group to another and beg for access to different systems. And it's really hard to make a data-driven decision or even make a model if you don't have data and you're not able to get data from all of those different systems. So I think modernizing the tech stack is really important. And I think that that's a difficult charge to give someone if you are a massive organization and everything that you have is on bare metal. And now someone like me is telling you, okay, well now you need to put everything into the cloud. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I do think that if you don't do that, your people are probably going to find another way to do their jobs. They may either leave or they will create a shadow IT system that you have no control over. So they may just take their corporate card and use that to get an Amazon account and then put up their own Kubernetes cluster and, and Dockerize their Flask apps and, and have everything set up in a way that you may not be happy with because you have no oversight over it. But so, who would ever do that? I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. And that's the plausible deniability here. Um, I do think that the culture change piece is a really big one, even with that infrastructure piece, because you have to show your CISO or whoever is in charge of that unwieldy tech stack that this is worth their while, that this is worth their budget, and that they need to treat they need to treat technology as less of a cost center and more of a profit center. And I think a lot of organizations, that's where they sort of fall down because they're just like, well, it cost me this much to have things the way that it is. And yeah, our business continuity plan is that we just call this guy on his cell phone if this particular thing breaks. But it's just not something that's going to work at scale, especially as you bring in all these different technologies. And then I think as you bring in those new things, keeping those, those tech partners apprised of what you're doing and involving them in the decision making is really important because their big concern is security, right? That's always the big concern that everyone has. And I found that if I'm going through an RFP process for a vendor or for uh, deciding which hyperscaler I'm going to go go to or what data warehouse I'm going to go to, I want to involve those tech guys, even if they don't have a lot of experience in the area, because it is educational for them. But also they tend to bring up things that I didn't think about because they actually know their infrastructure, like the back of their hand. They know what's wrong with it and what will work and what won't work. And involving them not only builds up goodwill, but it also means that you're probably going to be more likely to be successful at actually transforming that. Um, I think from a culture change perspective of the user, you're always going to have people who are really excited to use new technology, but you're, you're, you're also always going to have a group of people who are worried that it's going to take their jobs. And I think that that culture change aspect is something that people neglect. They just give them a predictive model or um, a, a generative model and then just say, okay, like go do your job and that, that's it. But explaining to them why they're, why you're giving them a model at all and what you're trying to do. So like an example I have is, is from insurance is working 
with a claims team and figuring out that travel insurance, you could just automatically adjudicate anything that was like $300 or below. And it wasn't actually worth anyone's time to look at, but it was worth their time to look at really complicated claims. So it was worth it for them to look at something where somebody is getting rescued from a remote area in a helicopter. That's worth that person's time. So I think being able to show them like, this is what the plan is. And we're actually trying to use your brain for when human intervention is needed. That's true for both predictive and generative AI. And that's also, that goes along with that tech stack, because if you're not able to access the data and you're not actually able to do anything with the data and you're not able to unify any of it, then you can't actually get to that point. So first it's having that foundation and then it's being able to, being able to then share that foundation and make it accessible to people from all over. What I love about that answer is that it really backs up what you're saying about the advantages of sort of maybe coming from a diverse and a, a, an unusual background is that like when you're coming in as a leader in this data science space and leading this kind of revolution, the first things that you're mentioning aren't if your models are overfit, it's not talking about which exact language you're using to implement it. It's a lot of breaking up f technology fiefdoms and trying to pull together stakeholders and really kind of get people understanding that vision. And I don't know if people would necessarily expect that you know, they're, if they're coming out of their uh, PhD program into a leadership role and thinking that, you know, if I hire a data science person, the first thing they're going to be able to tell me on week two or month two is what are the answers to my questions? And instead, you know, they have a, a, a sort of a longer, uh, maybe softer process ahead of them. Yeah, I think the soft skills are something that people don't value enough. Even during my PhD program, I remember making a point like fighting um, to make sure that I had time to take it. I, I made a point of taking a qualitative research course. And that wasn't hardcore stats like all the rest of my classes were, but that really taught me how to ask questions in a systemic way and get enough information to then analyze the answers and be able to make a judgment. And I think that that's something that I wish that I'd had that earlier. I wish I'd had that in undergrad. That was not something that was available to me at the time, but I think that was really important. I remember talking to somebody who had worked at Seagate, somebody who worked at a pharmaceutical company and someone who worked in machine tools and being able to see parallels in their leadership just from those qualitative research interviews. So I think that really has served me really well in dealing with people who are in the C-suite, people who are deep in engineering, people who are um, you know, in the actual lines of business, I'm able to relate to anybody. And I think that that's really important too, is to, is to make sure that, you know, you have empathy for the people that you're dealing with. Right. I think that's something that more people could have and just understanding where they're coming from and what their concerns are will help you get an ally instead of an enemy. All right. Well, we have more of this conversation with Gene Roberts, but first we're going to have a moment to acknowledge today's sponsor, This.Labs. This.Labs is a development consultancy that is trusted by top industry companies, including Stripe, Zero, Wikimedia, DocuSign, and Twilio. This. takes a hands-on approach by providing a tailored development strategy to help you approach your most pressing challenges with clarity and confidence. Whether it's bridging the gap between business and technology or modernizing legacy systems, you'll find a breadth of experience and knowledge you need. Check out how this.labs can empower your tech journey at this.co. That's T H I S D O T dot C O. And of course, thank you to my team for allowing me to have conversations like this. And now back to our conversation. So just before we went into there, I, I know before we were talking today, you were mentioning that one of the things that stood out to you in sort of the most recent move is that, you know, maybe people don't necessarily realize this, but AI didn't start with ChatGPT. We've sort of had AI uh, tools and approaches for a lot longer than that. But you were kind of talking about some of the difficulties and challenges that people uh, and leaders in your space have when they're sort of trying to introduce this kind of these technologies before. But yet we see such seemingly open handed adoption of or interest and fascination with sort of generative AI and those tools. So I was wondering if you had a sense of why that is what's what's different here and why are companies suddenly so open to these things when they maybe weren't as much with predictive ai 
I can tell you as someone who's been doing this for 10 years, that it was extremely frustrating <laughs> that, that was the part that that was adopted so quickly and that you would have to work for years to get one group um, after another to, 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 to start working with predictive. I think it's the accessibility factor. My father-in-law um, started to use ChatGPT before my husband and I, which told me that, you know, even the, you know, older boomers were, were accepting of this technology. And I should have realized at that point that this was very different. I think it's turned into the new Google or the new Wikipedia, where you go in and you ask it a question and it gives you a response. I do think that people need to be a little bit more hesitant about accepting what responses it gives them. But I think that accessibility factor is uh, is very appealing to people, just being able to, to ask a question. Whereas a predictive model, there's this whole data science value chain that you have to go through where you have to define the problem and then you have to ingest the data and you have to prep the data and, and feature engineering and all of this other stuff. And a lot of that stuff may still happen within generative AI, but it's under the hood and it's more accessible as a chat feature. And I think that's part of it. But I think also there's this feeling that if you are a leader at this point, even in a questionable economic environment, you are worried about not adopting this. And I think that that is the difference between predictive and generative. And maybe that's hype, maybe it isn't, but I've seen clients who you wouldn't think would want to spend money on this or wouldn't necessarily see a use case come up with lots of use cases and want to adopt generative AI immediately, some even before predictive. So it's it, it's it's one of those things where I think accessibility became it, it created the hype, but then there's also the piece of it's so easy. It's so easy for me to ask it questions, which then leads me to, but what if it's wrong? And I think that like with predictive, you do sometimes have explainability issues where it seems like it's a black box. But if you are a trained data scientist, you're generally able to look at results from a predictive model and understand where that's where that's pointing you. And then you can then point your leadership to that and show them that analysis behind it. But generative AI just tells you something and it doesn't really tell you necessarily what's behind it or how accurate it actually believes that it is. So I think it, at the same time that it's more popular, it can also be more dangerous. I think a lot of people would want to have someone like you on their team once they're adopting tools like this that has that level of data competence and data literacy and just familiarity with these tools. Um, but maybe one of the reasons that people are sort of gravitating to the sort of the generative AI is that is that active metaphor. It really has that we've sort of personified these AIs. We give them names and personalities. We really feel like we're speaking to a human being. And that's powerful, but it's also dangerous and misleading because that's not how they actually work. And people will put a lot onto the metaphor that doesn't exist. So for, for teams that maybe don't have someone with your expertise, what, what's your advice for how they need to be able to build the level of competency and understanding of kind of what they're working with here so that they aren't falling into potentially expensive or, or damaging pitfalls and or on the plus side, just maximizing the benefits they could get out of this? I think there's a few things that that value chain that I talked about, it doesn't disappear with generative AIs. You just don't see it anymore. I think defining the problem and figuring out what problem you're, you're actually trying to solve. A lot of people will tell us that they're really interested in generative AI, but when you, you know, peel back a few layers, it's actually a predictive AI problem. They're just not familiar enough with AI to understand. But I think the other piece is if you want to experiment with this stuff, it almost needs to be like a child's birthday party at a bowling alley where you have bumpers in the bowling so that their bowl, their ball isn't going to go flying across or they, they're going to be less likely to have a gutter ball and it's not going to, you know, create a whole lot of ruckus. And I think the same can be true for generative AI. I think as a practitioner, at least for me, me experimenting with it was really important for me to understand where we were with it because there's a lot of hype but i wanted to understand where we actually were so i tried a bunch of different open source tools i was playing around with langchain and you know i i was trying to to stand up my own little app so that i could look at fda data 
and on patient complaints, basically. I wanted to be able to access that and to see whether or not I could ask it questions like, you know, what's the migraine drug that has the most side effects or the most GI side effects? I wanted to be able to ask it that question and get an answer. And what I was learning was that number one, no one was really using a ton of data to put into those vector databases. So that particular database was like a terabyte. So I think like understanding that that's not gonna work and that you can't put a terabyte of data into a vector database, that was an important learning for me. But I think the other thing that I learned was that there is no, there, there is no inherent, at least an open source way that I found at, over the summer when I, I was really deep into this. I could not find an open source way that would tell, that would tell me whether or not the answer was right. So it could mm -hmm. tell me the answer and it may say Amovig, which I think is the migraine drug that has the most side effects. But I think not knowing whether or not that was really right sort of defeated the purpose of generative AI anyway, because you wanted to just get an easy response. But if you don't know that it's correct, then how useful is that response anyway? How valuable is that? So I think thinking about the kinds of problems that you want Gen AI to solve for you, what you actually want to do with it. So do you want to be a builder who's building LLMs or do you want to use someone else's LLMs and someone else's vector databases and you are, you know, embedding your own data in there? And then what problems do you see with using generative AI? And I think not knowing if an answer is right is a pretty big one if you're going to make a business decision or you're going to tell a client or make an investment recommendation based on that migraine drug. I think that that's an important thing to know. But I think the other piece is understanding that not every problem will fit within a generative AI box and that some of these things are not problems for generative AI that are instead predictive AI problems. Like finding money launderers, like that's a predictive AI problem. It's pretty easy to do that. That's one of the easiest use cases that I can think of for a bank to start with. But generative AI, I always think about it as, it's a way of taking large corpuses of data and making that accessible to people who can't code. Being able to get analysis out of that without people being able to code. So I think, I, I don't think I exactly answered your question because I think it's really hard to figure out who are the right people here, but I think you first need to figure out what are my problems and what am I concerned about with generative AI and what am I planning to do? Am I going to build stuff or am I gonna use things that are already built? Yeah, and what I like about what you said too is this idea that with predictive AI to the extent to which it was being adopted and, and discussed, there was starting to be conversations about bias and being able to not just accept what was coming out of the, the, the model, but to vet it and to be able to introspect in a bit of that decision-making process um, so that it's not just cheating and cutting corners underneath the hood because the data is incomplete. But maybe with generative AI, that hasn't really been as much of a conversation because it's not your model. You didn't train it. You're just sort of using it. But it seems like that ability to vet the results that are coming out of any model or any application of AI is maybe as important or more important than ever because, yeah, I mean, if you don't, if you can't understand if you're getting a hallucination or not, and then you're about to make a very important business decision or or submit something based on that, I mean, I don't, people need to be aware of how risky that is, really <laughs> especially scary. in a financial situation. It's really scary. Or if you're in healthcare and you're using that to figure out what you're going to um, prescribe to your patient, that's even scarier. It's one thing if you're losing money. It's another if you, you know, if, if you could hurt a human being. Um, I, I think, I think it's something to to consider. I think the other piece that we haven't really talked about is just the security piece of using somebody else's model out in the world and putting your own data into it. And what does that mean? And if you are an organization who isn't using generative AI, you probably still have people who are doing that at your organization. And I wonder how much of that is actually the adoption that we're seeing is people know that their staff are going to use this regardless, so they need to make it safer. 
Yes, I, I, I can speak for that too, that we started to look into these, these policies, privacy policies and data protection policies. And I don't know if our legal and technical communities have fully caught up to speed with what people are using on the job every day. <laughs> no, and I think that's another really good point is that we all know this from working in finance or, or even just working in tech, that regulations tend to lag technological advancement, right? And we have not, we've seen some executive orders passed down. We've seen some laws being passed in other countries, but a lot of clients and leaders that I have talked to have been asking us, well, what do we do to prepare? Because we know something's coming. And I think the answer is just what you had talked about, which is making sure that you are addressing bias and fairness, M making sure that you have something that's measuring correctness or toxicity. It's like, have you made your model become racist, right? Like it's not something that you want to do, but it can happen very easily. And then there's also just the documentation piece. And you needed this for predictive in finance anyway, because if you're going to launch any kind of model within a bank's ecosystem, especially if it's going to touch a customer, you have to go through a whole model risk management process where you have to present documents to um, an MRM committee and they have to vet what you did. And I think the same will probably be true for generative AI, but in a bigger way. And I think just having documentation of this is what we did. This is, these are the metrics that we have in place. This is the bias and fairness. This is what we, this is what we're doing to address all of your concerns. That's going to get you a lot of the way there because we know what people are worried about. Well, we've only gotten to scratch the surface of the wisdom that you have on these topics and the sort of people's fascination in these, in, in these subjects, but uh, this is going to be where we have to wrap it up for today. So can you let people know where they can find you online if they want to connect or maybe discuss this more with you? Sure. So I'm on LinkedIn. Um, so you can easily find me there. Um, and you can find me at data robot. I'm at gene.roberts at data robot.com. So you can find me there as well. And it was great to talk to you, Rob. It's, it's just fun to think about this stuff in a more holistic way than, you know, dealing with the block and tackle of, of every client that we have. So thank you so much. Of course. Thank you so much for being here. Well, that's going to be it for us today. Thank you so much to Gene for being our guest and thank each of you for being here and listening to this conversation. As we close out, uh, we'd just like to thank our sponsor one last time, this.labs, who'd like me to remind you all that they are trusted by top names like Meta, Google, and T-Mobile. This.labs helps bridge the gap from business requirements to tech implementation. Whether you're modernizing legacy systems, ensuring sustainable application architecture, or seeking expert guidance, this.labs has the experience to help Discover more at this.co one more time. That's T H I S D O T dot co. Thanks again and hope to see you all next time. Before we get back to our conversation, we wanted to say thank you to this.labs, who is the sponsor of today's show. If you need help with a project that has failed to deliver on time or are in need of a team that feels true ownership over your engineering projects, definitely hit up this.labs. They specialize in helping business leaders ensure their strategic digital initiatives stay on track. Trusted by companies like PlayStation, Capital One, Herman Miller, PayPal, and T-Mobile, you can find them at thisdot.co. That's T-H-I-S-D-O-T dot C-O. Now, let's return to our show.